She spent the first few years of her career chasing Somali pirates. So please welcome someone who I met where I didn't think I met. Please welcome Sarah. Nice. So where did so, we go? So oh, in, wait, fact, sorry, sorry. <laughs> in fact, I'm pretty sure that I, I, I like cold emailed you and basically was like, I think you worked for the Minnesota Vikings. Am I correct? Yes. And I'd love to chat and I'd love your help with my fantasy football lineup. So we met and we had like coffee somewhere. This part, are, I remember we did have like coffee somewhere in Nomad. Um, yes. And I'm like 99.9% .9 sure that happened before, like probably subsequently encountering each other at one of those dinners. But yeah, this is my recollection of it. And correct. I still want your help with my fantasy football. I would give you help, but Mike Bam, you, you spoke earlier. He's probably going to be even more helpful than I am. But I'll, mm. I'll give you my mediocre help compared to him. Nice. My, my, my strategy has been like, just get as many backup to running backs as possible because like COVID injuries, these all seem inevitable. Exactly. Okay. So thank awesome. you. I'm going to jump off stage and you can go on. Thank you. Cool. See you soon. Okay. Um, thanks again, Jared. It looks like everybody can see my screen. Um, so I'm going to start with two warnings. The first is that um, the title of the talk is like completely misleading. Um, today is not the day that I'm going to rant against machine learning. I'll probably save that for another day. But I do want to talk about, you know, causal inference and why it's not reaching its potential as well as uh, perhaps like how startups can help it reach its potential. Uh, the next warning is that like this talk is not gonna be technical. Um, as Jared mentioned, I used to be a data scientist. I'm not a data scientist anymore. Um, it's kind of like, um, what was that that like Sarah Barella song back in the day that the, the like, I'm not gonna write you a love song. And like people thought it was about her boyfriend. Um, but actually, it was about her like producer or I don't know, so, something like that. So when Jared reached out to me, I was like, sure, I'll speak, but I'm not going to write you a technical talk. Um, I will talk about startups and markets. That's what I do nowadays. So on that note, what do I do nowadays? Uh, so, oh, I'm Sarah Catanzaro. I'm a partner at Amplify Partners. And we're an early stage venture capital firm. Uh, we invest in technical tools and platforms, and I specifically invest in the data and ML stack. So a lot of people probably think that like I spend most of my time meeting with startups, uh, running diligence processes, negotiating terms, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. In fact, uh, that's not really true. I probably only do about like one to four deals a year. Uh, but I spend a lot of my time working on investment hypotheses. And the, the, these hypotheses will kind of guide my next set of investments. And also in some cases define like kind of the guidance that I give to my existing portfolio. So, you know, I do, I do seed in series A investing, which means I'm typically like the first or second check in. And, you know, most companies, most startups won't IPO until like at least seven to 10 years. So, Effectively, what I'm doing is, is you know, trying to predict like what is going to happen in the next seven to ten years. A large part of that is actually looking at like what are the problems that data teams face today? What are the solutions that they're implementing to solve those problems? And what either like new problems are those solutions going to engender, or what what new opportunities will those engender? And that's how I kind of got interested in potentially investing in causal inference. This is still all really rough investment hypotheses. It's like a very fuzzy art. Uh, I went from doing like rigorous data science to like mm, combination of like intuition and reasoning from first principles. So that's my like third caveat, I guess. Um, but yeah, let, let, let's talk about like what's happening now. So basically what I'm seeing is that like data teams have had this kind of like come to Jesus moment. They're realizing like finally that like both BI and AI initiatives, they're, they're, they're not going to succeed until data teams invest in, in data quality. And, and, and this is great. Like this has been my like rallying cry for like the past decade. Like 
do something about data quality. And it's finally happening. And you're seeing you know, companies uh, bring on both people as well as invest in tools that are really focused on, on integrating data from disparate systems, uh, building like core data models within the, the data warehouse, and then like even testing and monitoring those core data models. And again, like this is super awesome. It's not just awesome for you, like it's awesome for me too, because uh, we're also seeing kind of billion dollar companies emerge uh, in this space. So, you know, as an example, like DBT, which is designed to do like dimensional data modeling within the data warehouse, it is now a multi-billion dollar company. Great expectations, which enables you to kind of write tests on your Python data pipelines. Um, also a billion dollar company. And this is like super exciting, great for investors, great for practitioners. Um, but this market is becoming increasingly crowded. So like, frankly, I don't think like this is the right time to start a company focused on like data quality monitoring, for example. Um, there are just so many market participants. They're all venture backed. They all have, you know, war chest filled with like millions of dollars. And so, so, uh what i've been thinking about is like what happens next i mean effectively like if your team has seamless access to like well documented well tested well monitored data sets what is it that you do differently like ultimately like just having good data is not going to produce impact for companies but like something else might uh or something else in addition to having good data might so how I've been thinking about this is that like having good data really lets you do two things. Um, it allows you to answer existing questions better, um, but it also allows you to answer better questions. Uh, the, the, the way that I reason about this often is that like BI helps companies answer questions about what's happening now. Um, AI helps companies predict what might happen in the future. But causal inference actually helps companies answer questions about what they should do. And those are often like the most important questions. Uh, so as a little bit of an aside, like as a VC, I also attend a lot of board meetings. And sometimes like the board meetings are like just reporting, but more often than not, like the aim of the board meeting is to discuss the strategic issues that are going to kind of like make or break the company that will enable them to raise their next round of financing effectively or will you know lead to their like short-lived acquisition you know something like that and in fact like the questions that we're discussing the matters that we're discussing during these these board meetings like they're often they're often questions about causal effects um, these are the most important questions that that you know companies have to answer so if companies like want to become data driven, if, if they want to embark on like data driven decision making, then they need to figure out like, causal inference. But I think, you know, the problem that I see today is that companies neither have the tools nor the people um, to really do causal inference effectively. So, so they're, 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 they're asking and attempting to answer causal questions, but they're not really doing it well. And they're not doing it well because they just don't have like the capabilities and competencies. Uh, again, like not really rigorous science, but, but to provide some sort of like quote anecdotal evidence of this, uh, I looked at like causal inference and machine learning on LinkedIn and, and GitHub. Um, I think on LinkedIn, like a people search for machine learning returns something like 3.2 billion people. And the same search for causal inference returned like, what was it? About 10,000. So, so that's like pretty crazy to me. Um, similarly, when I searched uh, for repos on, on GitHub, machine learning returned like nearly 350,000 results and causal inference returned about 1,200. And, and look, like this is not like real evidence of anything, but you know, I think it does underscore the problem that like we want to ask questions about why things are happening and what we can do about it. Like these are critical to a business, but we don't know how. So this is kind of like where I'm at. Like I think that like with all of these investments going into building better data sets, 
we're going to see companies shift focus to like doing causal inference more effectively. Um, I wanted to I wanted to get like feedback on this hypothesis. So you know, obviously, again, like I did this in a really scientific way, and I posted it on Twitter. Uh, interestingly, like people almost unanimously agreed that causal inference would have a bigger impact on industry than machine learning. But they also acknowledged that like it's hard and too hard to do right now, and that's you know potentially crippling its adoption. So I have like the beginnings of this investment hypothesis about, about causal inference, um, but I need to like get more specific than that to like start trying to find companies or like trying to find people who will start companies. So I've just started like brainstorming about what types of tools, what types of platforms will actually enable companies to do you know, causal inference more effectively. Um, and I've been thinking about this by kind of reasoning about what I'm seeing in the ML ecosystem. Uh, you know, the, 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 the ecosystem of tools and platforms in machine learning, I would say, is probably a bit more advanced than, than in causal inference. And there was a hype cycle. That's what hype cycles do. Uh, but instead of just kind of like reasoning about this through the lens of machine learning, also got some feedback from you know, much smarter people, uh, people like Sean Taylor, Bryant Chen, Michael Kaminsky, uh, Jeff Wong, Mike Young. So if any of you are out there, thank you for your comments. But let's dive into this. So now the first thing that I think is going to happen is that we will see companies invest more in these tools and platforms that first enable them to do experimentation and then help them accelerate the pace of experimentation and kind of advance their experimentation methodologies. So, so like maybe why experimentation and not observational causal inference. So my, my colleague Sunil, he talks about this like stubbed your toe problem. Um, Maybe it's not even a problem, but essentially like what we see happening when any new technical paradigm emerges is that you know, companies see that paradigm and instead of thinking about like, what are the foundations that I need to do this effectively? Or like, how can I like prove this out in a narrowly scoped way? Instead, they say like, let's do the hardest thing possible. Um, so that's basically what we saw happen in, in machine learning, maybe like three to five years ago. Uh, instead of starting small, a bunch of companies hired teams of like PhD research scientists and asked them to build online deep learning systems. And in fact, a set of startups also emerged around that same time that basically said like, hey, Sears or like, I don't know, Shell, like we're going to help you build online deep learning systems, even though you might not even need them. Um, so not surprisingly, like these initiatives, they, they, they failed. Um, but I think that that failure was important in that, you know, it, it forced companies to kind of reevaluate what they were doing, forced them to step back and start smaller. So, so the same companies started to implement simpler models, you know, implement like linear regression on tabular data. And that really had like two important effects. The first was that by doing things in a more minimally scoped way, uh, they were able to really develop a better understanding of like what foundations they needed of, you know, some of the, the either data issues or, or systems architecture issues that really had to be resolved before they, they could do ML effectively. Um, the other thing is that like, they got some wins under their belt. Like they, they were able to implement simple models that worked. They were able to demonstrate results and get more executive buy-in and therefore they were able to kind of amass bigger budgets for the, these initiatives. And why this is important, at least from like a VC perspective, was like this created opportunity. Now you have these companies who had seen that ML could be effective. Um, it could kind of like move the needle for their business, but they also had a clear understanding of their kind of architectural and, and data needs. 
um, and an appetite to find startups that would address those needs. So I guess like TLDR is like, if you're going to build a tool kind of associated with a new technical paradigm, including something like causal inference, like wait for your customers to like stub their toe and kind of like come crawling back to you. Cause that, 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 that's basically what we saw happening in the ML space. Um, and, you know, since that's happened, we've seen kind of the rise of new ML tools and platforms, many of which are really focused on addressing either those like uh, data management issues. You see companies like like uh, Tecton, they're, they're building a feature store um, or like integrating with other elements or components of the tech stack. So, so AquaML is a company within our portfolio. They help users deploy like any model on any hardware backend. Um, the other thing that you saw too is that like the appetite to build like online deep learning models it, it didn't go away um and so in fact you know companies also sought tools that would help them make progress from these simpler models to you know things like transformers so now now there's like a lot of traction around companies like hugging face so you know i i, I think we are starting to see and we'll see more of <laughs> unfortunately or fortunately, I don't know, uh, similar similar phenomena in, in causal inference. There will be, there are some data teams that are like just rushing into observational causal inference. Um, and you know, maybe this is controversial, maybe it's not, but like, I think most of them will fail. Am I supposed to say that? I, uh, I can say whatever I want because none of you can react right now. Um, yeah, so so you know my 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 expectation is that uh, these data teams that that start their causal inference journey with observational causal inference will probably fail. Um, but they might then you know try again with like much simpler experiments, like things like two sample a b tests. Um, and through those tests, I think like they will similarly gain a better understanding of their data and system requirements, as well as like get some wins under their belt so that they can increase executive buy-in for experimentation and ultimately you no know, causal inference. So what is the, the kind of opportunity specifically? Now, as this process unfolds, I think we'll see more startups that are really focused on addressing, again, some of the, the kind of data issues associated with experimentation. Um, you're already starting to see this as it relates to like the demand for log enabled analytics. If you're going to run experiments, you have to trust your events. Um, right now, maybe you shouldn't trust your events. Uh, I think we're starting to see this too with like metrics management and enabling like fast uh, slice and dice on data that might exist in the data warehouse. Um, but beyond kind of the the like data and systems like things, I think we're also going to see a need for uh, tools and platforms that just help companies like run more experiments without uh, compromising on analytical rigor, and then ultimately move on to kind of more advanced, uh, like both assignment regimes as well as uh, experimentation methodologies. So, so we'll go from you know, the, the, those two sample A-B tests to maybe like heterogeneous treatment effects, maybe even contextual bandits. Um, and I do think like startups can play an important role in that journey. There's also a lot of random memes in here. I was going to talk about like machine learning and causal inference, and then I decided not to, but I didn't have time to replace the memes. So I hope you enjoy them anyway. Um, oh yeah, so um, I did put my money where my mouth is. Um, I do believe strongly that like we're going to see kind of this tidal wave of companies embracing experimentation in the next decade or so. And as such, I invested in an experimentation platform called Epo. You should all check it out at getepo.io or getepo.com. I can never remember domains anymore. So what else here? Um, I've been thinking about like, when we see a new technical paradigm, like relatively new technical paradigm, um, what are the sets of technologies that actually accelerate the adoption of it? And, and you know, initially I was thinking that it came down to kind of three things, uh, model evaluation, um, enabling more rapid iteration and facilitating uh, interaction with 
others, other stakeholders within the company. But as I was thinking about kind of like those three pillars, I realized that they all kind of collapse into one thing, which is enabling more rapid iteration. And I think there's both an acute need as well as like a market opportunity for, for tools that enable companies to iterate more rapidly on their causal models. And that do so by both facilitating or accelerating the pace of development, um, but also enabling iteration by you know, helping us understand what's working, what's not, um, and you know, facilitate collaboration thereby uh, allowing us to get feedback from other types of stakeholders. So how did this play out in ML? Well, I mean, like just go look at ML ops. It's, it's you know, attracting like a ton of investment, um, which it didn't attract you know, when, when the ML hype cycle like first uh, really started, started uh, kind of peaking maybe like 2014, 2015. Um, and I think what happened was like some companies uh, successfully deployed their first model and they got kind of like hooked on it like new modeling techniques they, they they can be like a drug you do it once and you do it well and then you're like oh man gotta do that more and not just more but 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 you know faster and in order to do like more and faster you often need tools associated with operations so you know how has this played out in ML? Well, I think like we see it playing out in a couple of domains. One is higher level modeling frameworks, and those that are really designed to eliminate the need for glue code, as well as uh, just thinking about like low level implementation details. Um, the other is distributed trading. Like if you have to wait for things, then you're not going to work as effectively, and that that that's kind of a problem when you have you know. ML scientists that are paid like $500,000 a year. You don't want them waiting for their model to train. Um, model evaluation and monitoring, as I had mentioned earlier, I think is key to iterating because you need some way of understanding like what is working, what is not working, what is working better than, than you know, something else. And then finally, I think, you know, these tools that, that really focus on enabling data scientists to build user facing applications, help facilitate communication with other teams such that like, you have other, other guidance on, on how you might iterate. So I think we're going to see again, something similar happen in causal inference where now, once companies start running more and more sophisticated experiments, they're going to want tools to build better causal models faster. Um, the clearest need to me, honestly, is for like higher level modeling frameworks. Um, I was reading a blog post from like Stitch Fix recently where they developed you know, some sort of like wrapper around causal impact that like leveraged higher level abstractions. Um, if if you know companies are like building wrappers around things, uh, we probably need just easier to use frameworks. Uh, that that that's my general observation. So so I do think that there's a pretty clear like white space um, in terms of like easy to use modeling frameworks, especially those that that can provide a more unified way of uh, specifying like different uh, models for causal effects. Um, computational efficiency, like uh, for a while I didn't get this. When, when I saw it happening in, in ML, I'm like, well, like these teams, their, their budgets just keep increasing and increasing. So, so like, why does distributed training matter? And I didn't realize that it, it mattered until I, I, I you know, started talking to various research scientists and they're like, it matters because I can work more if things move faster. Um, and I think, again, like the same is, is actually true in, in causal inference, like you want to move to heterogeneous treatment effects and, and other types of like more advanced modeling techniques, but these are really computationally and memory expensive. Um, and what computationally and memory expensive translates to is just like slow and costly. Um, Netflix actually put out a white paper maybe a year ago, maybe less than a year ago on a domain that they're calling uh, computational causal inference. And they put forth like a couple of suggestions on how we can make causal inference models more computationally efficient. Um, and I think that, that this is like a pretty exciting domain. 
And to the last one, which almost made me like bow out of this talk. Cause I'm like, maybe I'm just totally wrong here because if we can't figure this out, like then it's doomed. Um, I really do believe that the ability to compare and validate machine learning models has helped unlock its success. And like for that reason, you actually do see like a lot of tools focused on like what they call experiment tracking. It's always confusing because it doesn't mean A-B testing. It basically just means like looking at different versions of your model and the associated metrics, uh, but not in production. Um, uh, you know, things like ML flow, Metaflow, weights and biases, replicate, like there, there, there are dozens of these now. Um, but they both facilitate iteration and I think also help build like organizational trust in those models, even though the model metrics don't often end up giving you a complete view of what's going to happen in production. Um, there's some sort of like, I don't know, weird psychology going on there. And I don't know if it's possible to, to, to like validate causal models effectively. Um, that said, I'm a VC. So I get to like, just sit here and be like, this is something that one of you should build. Um, and maybe it's not possible and, and you know that that's what it is. Um, in the meantime though, I think that like, the way that I often see companies using at least like observational causal inference today is that they're, they're, they're effectively using it as a way to generate like a set of potential interventions. And then they're they're using you know, A-B testing to, to actually like validate um, their, their causal models or perhaps not actually, but whatever it is. So um, some of you might have seen this slide in Sean Taylor's talk on uh, when and why to use causal inference uh, a couple of months ago. Uh, Sean, you know, certainly pointed to the fact that like there are significant investments happening uh, in the ML space right now, uh, particularly you know around around these areas of ML training and model storage and serving. Um, because like predicting things is is important to companies. But I wanted to present real venture capitalist mode. Um, so like, the ML space, it's, it's also just super duper crowded. And like, to be honest, I think we'll still see new entrants because like most of those tools suck. Um, but if causal inference is going to have a bigger impact on industry, that also means that there's going to be bigger opportunities to you know, make that, that possibility a reality. So uh, if you are building one of these tools, you know, call me, email me. I'm Sarah at amplifypartners.com. And with that, I'm off. Thank you very much, Sarah. Uh, that, was, that was really great. I love all the uh, um, chirping at Sean Taylor and Chris Alban. That was, all, that was really all pretty awesome. So thank you very much for that excellent talk.